to start the slideshow from the beginning. So is this working, Elizabeth and Iwe? Can you see me and you can see the screen? Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right, so here's my book. So first of all, I wanna thank everybody, all of you participants who are interested in citizen science and social and environmental justice, because that's the focus of tonight's talk about citizen science. And um, I'm, I'm gonna talk for like 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how verbose I get in the middle of my slides. And um, I know that a lot of you in tuning into a presentation about social and environmental justice in this moment in time that we're in uh, are looking for things to do and, and really concrete projects and outcome outcomes. So I'm gonna do my best to direct you to some sources for that. But the kind of writer that I am and the kind of research that I do is is kind of I straddle um, kind of a more historical literary point of view with more practical outcomes. So to the extent that you guys have questions for me, specific questions, put them in the chat um, and, and I, will, uh, I will approach those questions tonight, hopefully. And if I can't, then you can email me tomorrow. Huge thanks to Elizabeth. I love librarians in general. They are saints in a way, secular saints. My sister Julie is a high school, uh, middle school librarian. And um, I cannot say how much librarians do for us and for democracy. They are the ultimate um, social and environmental justice uh, gatekeepers. And Iwe, who has just done such an amazing job at the San Francisco Bird Observatory. And this is a, an incredible place that um, has a lot to do with the with environmental justice in the San Jose South Peninsula region, and also though with bringing joy into our lives, which we need. Right, we need that very much in terms of what we're going through now, and going to the to a future that we can all kind of feel okay about going to. So here's a cover of my book, Citizen Scientist Searching for Heroes and Hope in an Age of Extinction, and it's super fun for me to talk to a local audience, you in San Jose because I really focused quite a lot in this book on California and on the Bay Area. And one of the things that I uh, really understood when I was researching this book is how very deep what environmental issues that we have today, social justice issues that we have today have deep historical antecedents. You know, there's a reason why we have them today because of what came yesterday. So this title, Stewarding Cre Creation, the Amamutsin quest for identity and to restore traditional knowledge. This is a story that I'm going to tell you about traditional ecological knowledge and a very deep sense of what citizen science is. So citizen science is regular people um, contributing to scientific research. This is it Santa Cruz Mountains? This is um, a map of Native American uh, polities, as the anthropologists call it, before 1769, before Portola came and made quote unquote first contact with Native Americans. So many of you know this term colonialism. Ooh, the baddest thing. Bad, bad, bad. Colonialism. Oh my God. Uh, colonialism is a real thing. And this was a real thing that happened in 1769 to the Bay Area. Um, all of our, many of our ecological problems today stem from things that happened in 1769. Many of our contemporary issues with how to deal with our environment and steward it in such a way that we'll have a plausible future um, stem from 1769. And it's not just what, it, of course, you know, we talk a lot about right now about attitudes, racial attitudes, um, sexual discrimination attitudes, all those attitudes add up to, you know, enormous impacts on the physical environment. And, and that's what I'm interested in because, you know, people, we're either going to work it out or we're not, but the physical environment is changing because of what we do on it. And citizen science is just an enormous and, and indispensable pathway to understanding that. Okay, so this map is, so what I'm doing here is taking you back in time a little bit to 
what the Bay Area was like in the 1700s, but through a story that exemplifies what citizen science is. And I can't remember whether it was Iwe or Elizabeth who mentioned citizen science versus community science. So sometimes um, citizen science is a, a term that's objected to. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sort of telling you two narratives at once. Let me get a little bit clearer. I'm going to, I'm going to stop with the big um, overview of citizen science. I'm going to bring you back to what you're looking at. Okay. This is a map of uh, the San, Santa, near Santa Cruz, Año Nuevo Coastal Nat Natural Preserve, kind of close to San Jose on the coast. That White House Creek Road is there. You, you might want to go hiking there. It's an absolutely beautiful place. And in that area, um, about, I think, 20 years ago, a California a state, California state archaeologist found the remains of what's called Kurosti or the big house. And this was the Native American meeting place of many polities where Portola, who was a Spanish conquistador, who wasn't a conquistador, Spanish um, emissary from the crown came and made first contact with the native Californians. So first contact is just this huge um, what do you call it? Uh, something that sounds better, a euphemism. Because yeah, it was first contact, but it was also like a death knell for the civilization that had occurred for thousands of years before that Spaniard came. So the Spanish um, colonial system was gigantic. It was global. And um, basically the Spanish crown was looking for more resources to exploit to make themselves richer back home. They were also very much embedded and entwined with the Catholic Church. And so they were also looking to harvest new souls to save those souls and to make those souls Christian. So this is kind of the mindset of Portola coming to the Bay Area looking for resources and looking for souls. So found Indians, Native Americans, Native Californians, and an immense amount of resources um, to exploit. So this is an old map of California um, depicting California as an island. California is not an island, as we all know. It's, part, it's a state. It's part of the continent. But because of the Sierras and the intercoastal ranges, we have a very special and very unique ecosystem in California. And so, in fact, ecologists refer to California as an island ecosystem, even though it's not literally an island. And this kind of map actually makes reference back to ideas about the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden is an idea that persisted through the mental and historical life of um, European Americans for, for centuries. And the most persistent, uh, long-term, like place where that could possibly be located, was thought to be California. So we all live in California tonight. I think probably most of us on this call, and we know that California is a kind of an Eden. Um, it is special. We're glad we live here mostly, and um, it is it is a unique place. It is not an island, actually, though. And then some negative things happened to California that were also happening around the world and around especially North America. So the whaling industry, which was huge in the East and was a huge driver of the economic development of the East Coast into a sovereign nation that eventually became the United States of America. Um, you know, you can't make a sovereign nation without money, without commerce. So this was a problem from the very beginning when the, when the pilgrims came to the United States from what are now the United States. They came to North America from England. They didn't know how to make a living. They didn't know how to survive. And uh, an Indian taught them how to harvest beavers. And the beaver trade became a 300-year market that is really the foundation of the United States. That's a story that I tell in my previous book called The Spine of the Continent. In um, Citizen Scientist, I talk about how when the East Coast whaling industry 
basically drove all of the whaling pop whale populations to near extinction, it increased over to the west coast. But in those days, in the 1700s, it was super hard for those Europeans to get to the west coast. There was no Panama Canal. So they had to go all the way down under South America and, um, and to over to up here to the coast where we, you know, we can see whales these days. But they, they decimated whales here too. And whales play a very large part in the ecosystem. And when you take them out in huge numbers, which we did, you put a big um, negative impact on the ecosystem. Here's people um, killing seals, fur seals for their fur. So they took out all of, you know, hundreds of thousands of seals, just absolutely brutal killing of physical animals. Grizzly bears were just gigantic enormous numbers in California and especially here on the coast. I think Berkeley, the name Berkeley refers to bears. Um, grizzly bears had a great time before Europeans came to the west coast because they are omnivores. They love to eat fish and they also love to eat um, vegetables. They eat meat when someone else has killed it usually and they had the most amazing um, meal plan on here on the west coast and then when the spanish came they basically set about exterminating all the grizzly bears because the spanish among other things they also killed wolves and and mountain lions the the spanish were interested in bringing cattle to the west coast so that they could grow beef for people to eat and then, of course, these top predators in the wild ecosystem, grizzly bears, wolves, and mountain lions were competitors for those, um, those ranch resources because they also wanted to eat the cows, and especially the calves that were easy to kill. So here we have just like, sometimes I give a presentation and I do explain it in my book uh, and in my books, both The Spine of the Continent and Citizen Scientist about how taking out these animals, reducing their numbers, has an immensely negative impact on how the whole ecosystem functions. Uh, beavers also, another whole story, again, mostly told in the spine of the continent. All of these animals have this huge effect on how the ecosystem functions. This is a shot from uh, the, the gold rush and the, the deforestation of the gigantic redwood trees. This is a redwood tree. Can you imagine the size of that redwood tree? Look at all those, those guys. So this just enormous dissension of locusts in the form of human beings um, descended on the coast of California during the gold rush, not only looking for gold, but also then harvesting redwood trees and, and uh, reducing the population of redwood trees at least you know, by three quarters in a very short period of time. So today, one of the wonderful organizations to support in the Bay Area is Save the Redwoods League. They do fantastic work and uh, they are safeguarding and protecting the last redwoods that we have left. And they're also really investing in the future about where can redwood trees persist in a time of global change, of climate change. So when the Spanish came to California, to our area, the first thing they did is they stopped Indians from burning the landscape. So native Californians burned the landscape. This is a fascinating story of um, an ecological relationship between people and the landscape. And, and they uh, promoted the populations of wild animals and wild ecosystems through the use of fire. So these native Californians were on the landscape for thousands of years before the Spanish came. And so the ecosystem had actually adapted to human um, instigated fires. But then the, the Spanish came and they stopped all that. So I'm gonna just um, give a little pause. This is the most wonderful book. You can get it out of the library, Tending the Wild by, by Kat Anderson. But you might be asking yourself right now, and I'm, I'm wondering that I haven't set this up quite right for you about what does all this have to do with citizen science? 
So citizen science is regular people contributing to scientific research. That's you and me without a PhD. I will give you some resources for how to participate in that or how to set up projects yourself before the end of my talk. But in general, citizen science is a whole kind of area of how of knowledge of of direct knowledge of how nature works that has a hugely long tradition. So in the Western European tradition, Charles Darwin, who codified his theory of evolution by way of natural selection, he was a citizen scientist, no advanced degree, and he didn't work for anyone. He was an independent scholar. Um, and he made massive observations of wildlife and of processes over time. And all of that data collection is what he used to build uh, and uncover his theory of, of evolution, which has turned out to be extremely correct. So lots of um, PhD scientists after Darwin, since you know the late 1800s, set about to prove or disprove Darwin <coughs> using what more codified, perhaps, data. And all the data shows that Darwin was right. So Darwin was a direct observer of nature. So were California Native Americans, or Native Californians. Thousands of years of living very closely with other species, plants, and animals, and making a living off of cultivating those populations. So the Spanish came and they interrupted all that. That's the grotesqueness of, of uh, the colonial, kind of the colonial, I don't know, karate chop. This is a slide that is talking about an Australian tribe that still exists and still burns uh, the landscape as part of its hunting and gathering routine. Um, and the reason I include this is to say that indigenous people all around the world um, have used fire as part of how they relate to the landscape. So in my book, in my citizen science book, um, I profiled the Amamutsin tribe, which are located or they are affiliated with the Santa Cruz Mountains, just around and a little bit south of San Jose, where presumably all of you guys are who are on this, this Zoom call. This is Val Lopez, who's the chair of the Amamutsin people. And the reason I got to this story is because of this historical trajectory of what has happened on the landscape and archaeologists led by Kent Lightfoot at UC Berkeley did just a gigantic, you know, decadal over several decades study of this big house of the Quirosti place where uh, this archaeologist had found all of these remains of, of the native Californian um, people and what they had done there. And so this archaeologist, Kent Lightfoot, and a huge team of people from all kinds of disciplines uh, set to studying this and trying to understand what happened here. But in the, in the world of archaeology and anthropology, these are fields which have been very sensitive for many decades to this whole idea that if you're a scientist studying people and indigenous people, you are already, you are still being exploitative of those people if you come in as we're the scientists, you're the subject. So archaeology and anthropology had a, a nervous breakdown decades ago in which they said we can't do that anymore. Because if we act that way, then we are being the same as those colonial ex exploiters. So a long time ago, this is a very deep thread of what citizen science is about today. Archaeologists and anthropologists said we have to co-create projects with the people we want to study. We want to study them. We want to understand what they their history is, but we can't just be the only ones with the questions. So now it is standard really for an archaeologist or an anthropologist to say to local people 
uh, we'd like to study your history, but what would, would you like to collaborate with us? And in terms of how you'd like to collaborate, what would your questions that you would like to be, to ask? So the Abamutsin people, uh, Val Lopez being the leader, said, yeah, we'd like, to, uh, we'd like to help you. We'd like to help you figure out our past because we would like to recuperate our past. We'd like to know more about our past so that we can restore our historical practices, our cultural practices that for thousands of years helped our people um, be a healthy, vibrant community. And that healthy, vibrant community was torn apart by colonialism. Um, so this is just a huge um, concept, really. Um, these are young members of the Amamuts and tribal people today who are involved with this work at Kurosti. And they help. So what they want to do is restore cultural practices, which includes burning. It also includes cultivating certain plants that are sacred to the tribe. And um, these are young people that have known nothing of their cultural heritage and live pretty hard lives. And uh, there's a beautiful image of the Amamutsin Land Trust t-shirt, uh, research and education, conservation and restoration, indigenous stewardship. So this is like a, a paradigm of what citizen science can accomplish for us, or it's a paradigm of the mechanism where local people with local concerns can be part of an investigation, a scientific investigation that can help restore knowledge or create new knowledge to um, better their connection with their own resources and their own destiny, if you will. So these are some of these younger tribal people. This is Rick Flores, who is a, I haven't checked in with him too recently. He might have his PhD by now, but he's running um, the uh, San, Santa Cruz Botanical Garden, where he created an Ama Bootsen uh, garden. What, what, so it was a big part of his garden there is what the landscape would have looked like when the Native, Amer Native Californians, the Ama Bootsen people were living on the land without, without this big colonial force. And Pie Ranch, if any of you have been happy and fortunate enough to stop there and get a pie, which are delicious, Pie Ranch is a wonderful place that is, is uh, helping the Amamutsen and has created a learning garden there on their property. And this is a photograph of a controlled burn. And this is a practice of um, helping to cultivate the landscape. So I should say that, you know, much of the problem we have here in California with these wildfires that burn wildly out of control are partly the result of suppressing small fires. Small, so the landscape evolved with small controlled burns at a low level for, for thousands of years. And then that was stopped. So then all of this very flammable brush has um, accumulated in the last 200, 300 years. And when, so when an ember flies, everything goes up in smoke. And it's just one, um, so the wildfires, you know, right now we're focused on COVID, but we will be confronted with wildfires soon enough, right, as the fall encroaches. And um, there's so many levels upon which we're pushing earth processes and survival to a breaking point. And so what on earth are we going to do about that? How can we approach it? And the answer, I think, is citizen science. So here's, I'm going to give you a couple, a little bit of a quick tour through some, some, some um, tools that, that are out there. The wonderful thing about citizen science is it's free. It's not, you know, it's not free really because to run a program, you need to hire somebody often, you need to pay somebody, nobody does any, you know, none of us can do anything for free all the time because you need to make money to pay your rent and to put food on the table and to get your health insurance. So citizen science is free in that the tools are free and widely available. This is one of them called OpenStreetMap. 
So the world of um, citizen mapping and citizen science are very much the same thing, really. So if you look at it this way, the Amamutsin people do not have tribal sovereignty. They are not re recognized by the federal government as an official tribe. Therefore, they do not have uh, a reservation. They do not have land that is theirs. And that happened to a lot of California Indians for very deep and, you know, fraught reasons. One of the reasons is that they didn't have open street map in the 1700s or the 1800s when the Spanish stole their land. And then when the, the gold rushers came and stole more of their land. With something like open street map, uh, who owns what? And what is what is democratically open and available. So this is just a screenshot that I took today of OpenStreetMap of San Jose. And let's just talk for one minute here about environmental justice. Uh, in general, your neighborhood where you live is better for your health and well-being if there is a lot of biodiversity around you, if there's a lot of there's a lot of trees, there's a lot of shrubs, there's birds, there's insects. That's, you want rich biodiversity. It is psychologically better for you. It's emotionally helpful for you and it is better for your microbiome. So just looking at OpenStreetMap, you can start looking at San Jose and say, well, who lives where? Like the most expensive houses, right? Or, uh, where, or the expensive communities are in places that are green, right? And, and the less expensive places that are, that are more where people have to live if you don't make a lot of money are more, more cement filled. So right now we get to start quantifying how much greenery is where. And so if you can quantify that, you can show this data on a map, you can bring that piece of evidence to a city hall meeting that is demanding more greenery or more investment in green infrastructure in different parts of the city. So that is environmental and social justice right there. This is uh, an organization, HOT, Humanitarian Open Street Map Team. So this, this organization is global and works around the world to do all kinds of mapping on behalf of social and environmental justice issues. So down here on the bottom of the slide, you'll see impact areas, disaster risk reduction. Okay, so that's something to talk about. It's like, where are you at a sea level rise? Are you in New Orleans? Are you in Florida? Are you in an underserved community where your house is going to be impacted by sea level rise? That This map will show that. This map gives you the data to say, I'm in trouble and you need to help me. Um, but mapping is a very profound dimension of citizen science. Even citizen science that's about butterflies, that's about birds, is ultimately about mapping. Where are the animals when? Because that's how you know when and where to protect them and what the impacts of where they are is. Now, okay, now I'm gonna take a little take a little step to the side to tell you about um, an amazing researcher. Her name is Max Liberon, Dr. Max Liberon. And um, if you have a pencil, write down Dr. Max Liberon and look for her, uh, look for this particular presentation on YouTube. Tools, Practices and Ethics for Monitoring Marine Plastic Pollution Developed in a Feminist lab Laboratory. So her whole thing is, I have an anti-colonial laboratory. So that colonialism, where the Spanish come in, they take over the indigenous people, they steal all their land, they kill the people, they steal everything, that's colonialism. It still goes on, it's going on now. She is working, um, and other people are too, but this is an excellent example of a citizen science platform that is helping in the quest um, to resist colonialism. So she, this is a slide, you know, she, she answers the question, if you call yourself a feminist lab, does that make you biased? And she argues that the minute you're a scientist, you're taking a side. Uh, this slide 
in this in this part of her presentation, she makes a, a, a distinction between equality and equity. And on the left hand side are microplastic particles. So what she does is she studies microplastics off the coast of Canada. So here is the usual uh, scientific instrument that is used to collect microplastics out of water. It costs $35,000. So that is not accessible to underserved communities that don't have 35 grand. She has a place-based replacement that costs $500, which is a fantastic thing. Um, it's, it's kind of, you know, um, jerry-rigged a little bit. The expensive part of it is the net that's very fine. And then Max Liberon developed something that's even cheaper, $12. Um, I think she calls this baby legs. So Max Liberon's whole thing is you can create instrumentation to uh, analyze your environment that are cheap and affordable. Sometimes the instrumentation is so expensive that a community can't afford to use it. So what she found out in her community in Canada, there's a, a Christian community that is very devoted to baptisms. And when you have a baby girl and you baptize that baby girl, she has to be wearing tights and they don't have a lot of money. So that like the local CVS or Walgreens or the equivalent carries tights for these baptisms and they cost like three dollars for a pair of tights so you can buy these tights and then add them to this other contraption and make a perfectly useful monitoring tool for microplastics so max liberon monitors microplastics off the coast of canada and uh, she finds microplastics everywhere. I mean, you've, you've read about this, you've heard about it. We're ingesting them, we're breathing them, we're eating them. This is her on the left in the red boots. And this is her giving her results to a local community meeting. So her thought about really being anti-colonialist and being really fair to a community is to say, you know, I did this research and I found these results. Uh, there's a lot of microplastics in the fish and, and that, that you're catching, catching. So fishing community, that's how they make their living. I could publish this data because I'm a PhD scientist. That's what I do. I publish data. But I want to know whether you want me to publish it or not. So she shows the data showing how much plastics are in the fish in her environment. And she shows it to the community and she gives them a context around it. And the community says, yes, please publish the data because even though they are finding plastics in the cod in Newfoundland, it's much less than is being found in the cod that's coming from Europe. So actually the European cod has more plastic in it. So if you're a consumer at the grocery store, you might want to buy the Newfoundland cod rather than the European cod so that you'll get less plastics. But the whole point of this is that it's the community that decided about what to do about the information about its own landscape. Now, this is a great thing. Like what if we could have meetings all the time with people who are doing science, people who are doing analysis, people who are making observations about how we're living um, and we could decide together do we want it published do we not want it published where does it fit in with the global story and she is working in a small community in canada you know most of you i'm assuming are in san jose i'm in san francisco we're in very large communities where there's many parts of our community and so we're not going to come to agreement very easily at all about what we want to do about any data. So we have something of a different situation. Now, if you are sitting there tonight and you're thinking, I want to do something for social justice or environmental justice for my community. I want to come up with a citizen science project so that I can measure um, environmental impacts in my area. 
And I want to be able to make an argument at City Hall about whether we need more money. We need different kinds of infrastructure. We need different, better water quality. We need better air quality. Then what are you going to do? Yes, citizen science is there for you. Uh, now, if you want to do air quality or water quality, you want to look for the Environmental Protection Agency. You want to connect, hopefully, with an actual scientist working locally in San Jose or wherever you are, and then work together with that person to develop um, a protocol for collecting data. Now, iNaturalist.org here is my, one of my favorite, you know, it's, it's a fantastic platform, not for water or earth quality, but for biodiversity richness. So one of the things that I referred to earlier is that if you live in a place that is full of biodiversity, so lots of trees, lots of shrubs, lots of birds, lots of bugs, you live in a healthier environment. So how can you prove to somebody in city hall or board of supervisors or whoever is making a hearing on whatever, that you need more support to have more biodiversity, you can create a project on iNaturalist. And um, iNaturalist, as well as many other of the platforms for citizen science, have a very deep bench of um, links in their websites to how to do things, to curriculum for teaching children, to, to all kinds of questions and answers. It takes some time for you to dig in and really figure out how you want to use it for your own cause. Um, but iNaturalist is there for you and so are many other things like eBird. Um, I will say that if you want to do something very specific today for environmental justice using citizen science, just be sure to use one of these databases like iNaturalist, Nature's Notebook, which is about plants and trees mostly, and eBird, which is about birds, use one of these databases that has a huge repository of data already and a very specific way of collecting data. Because if you collect data in your own way, it won't be able to be analyzed next to other data that's been collected. So it won't mean anything. It's like apples and oranges. You need everything to be fruit collected. That's kind of a stretch of it. Of, um, of a metaphor. Literacy for Environmental Justice. This is an amazing and fantastic, wonderful organization in San Francisco um, focused on kids and learning uh, with really practical um, activities and projects that kids participate in. Bayview um, Heron's Head Point kind of area. This is something for you to look at. Um, if you're interested in, in kids. And then this is a wa water quality project on a website called SciStarter.org. So that's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.org. And this uh, has protocols and, a, and um, instructions for how to measure water quality, if that's something that you're interested in pursuing. This is an older slide from one of the San Francisco Bay Observatory talks. Um, they do, it's, it's a citizen science organization. You know, birders are citizen scientists. And um, when you observe birds with purpose, with taking the data, you are helping support those birds because you're helping create a narrative, a story about how they're doing. And then this is a local San Jose project by um, Mirav uh, Viran, so I'm forgetting Mirav's last name, BioBlitz Club. Check her out, join up with her. BioBlitzes are a fabulous, fun um, citizen science activity. Mirav also is one of the main people at a an ant survey that's been going on at Stanford University for years. She's a very lovely person and um, so, so inspiring. And what she does is fantastic. And you're lucky because she works in your area. So bioblitz.club, Marav, uh, check her out. So I think I am at the end of my presentation.
I'll stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to respond to questions. Yes, I see someone that says, love Marab, she's awesome. I totally agree. Okay, so in the chat, I don't see any questions yet, only a confirmation that Marab is great. So if you guys have questions, do let me know. Oh, there she is, Von Shack. I was forgetting your last name, Marav. Marav Von Shack. Please um, look at her bio, but you know, join up with her. So people write in your questions and we will respond to them. So it looks like we have a question from Vanessa Ferrer. How did I get into this work? Thank you, Vanessa. Oh my goodness. So I put the marker basically at 2007 or eight, when I wrote a book about evolution. Um, and I've always been interested in science, but my background is in literature. I was a travel editor, I was a book review editor. So I get this job um, to write a book about evolution. I didn't get the job, I totally tried very hard to get it. I wrote um, many, um, proposals and finally got a finally got a book contract to write a book about evolution that was based on the specimens of the California Academy of Sciences. The kind of science that goes on there uh, is very, it's not citizens, they do now have fantastic citizen science program and also house iNaturalists. So it's become a leader in citizen science, which is kind of ironic because in 2007 and eight, when I was researching that book, um, nobody believed in anything like citizen science, like only PhDs, only people with, you know, the most amazing credentials could do science. But while I was understanding how evolution occurs, um, I was also hearing from every scientist that were in this, uh, you know, downward spiral, spiral with biodiversity and we're in a sixth mass extinction of plants and animals. Now we're in an insect apocalypse. I mean, the, the, um, the news just doesn't get any better. It just is not getting better. And so I, I finally kind of understood, oh, you know, Elizabeth Colbert's book, Six Extinction, kind of brought the idea into a general consciousness about the sixth extinction. That didn't come out until 2014. So I was thinking about it before then, and um, I wanted to know what was happening. Um, so then I wrote The Spine of the Continent, and that is a, uh, an investigation of conservation biology and how we know about extinction. Mostly focused on the Intermountain West in, in North America. Really, really fortunate um, project for me. I just absolutely loved it. And then while I was on the spot of the continent, I was asking myself, all these wonderful people trying to save nature, and they're just not doing a good enough job. It's not that they're not doing a good enough job. It's just they can't be effective. Why not? And then uh, when you go to lots of science conferences and to lots of meetings about conservation, here are two things all the time. We need more data because we don't know exactly where plants and animals are when and we need more people involved. But then I also was noticing that all the projects that I was profiling in the spine of the continent that were effective had a common denominator, which is that regular people were involved in collecting the data. And that had two parts. One is they had enough data, and the other part is they had advocates who helped um, get things done on behalf of, behalf of the animals or plants that were under siege. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do my next book on citizen science because this is what this is and it's so fabulous. And I was um, very fortunate really, or I just hit it at the right time of citizen science started to just boom, especially with uh, digital technology. 
And um, I see it is still booming, but we still need to really support it and encourage it. And I, I've been all about biodiversity and, and uh, extinction. And that is my main passion. But I also want people to understand like this tool of mapping and data collection, it's useful for every kind of justice issue and um, of really seeing what's happening um, on the landscape. So that's how I got into it. And then I found it absolutely fa fascinating to really get, get into the details of it, which I tell in my book. All right, so I'm gonna go up here in the, um, the chat because now people have asked questions, thank you. Is there one project cause that you think needs more attention from community members right now? Yes, nature. I mean, namaste. We are very focused on, and it's inextricable from environmental justice, social justice. We're very focused on the rights of people. We have to be, and there's no way around it. But that's not the end game here. The end is to actually also include the biosphere because humanity has become such a gigantic force on this earth that we're actually changing how the earth functions, not for the better. And the earth doesn't care if we're male or female or what, what race or ethnicity or heritage we have. It, it cares that we um, are consumers of energy and we are wasters of other things, you know, of energy. So, um, but to be more specific in the Bay Area, I think our main issue is the Bay Delta. We got problems there and it's gonna be a disaster if the levee breaks, so to speak, before we figure it out. And it's just such a very human situation because all of these rights went to farmers and municipalities and business people from the, the gold rush on destroying the habitat for birds and for other creatures. I'm um, just, you know, they don't count, right? It wasn't their land, it's our land. We're gonna take it, it has value to us. Um, but now it's the, the actual physical system is breaking down. And um, with climate change, we need to deal with it. So the Bay Delta is the huge issue for the Bay Area, including down the peninsula in San Jose. You know, you have fantastic, you have the Santa Clara, you know, open space, you have Mid-Pen, mid um, you have Post, Peninsula Open Space Trust. I mean, you have fantastic people working on behalf of these issues and on local land issues. Those are people to get involved with. Uh, fantastic, I mean, couldn't really be better. How does citizen science achieve credibility? Well, here's the fantastic thing about citizen science. If you use an app like iNaturalist or eBird or Nature's Notebook, then what you have is the credibility of the atomic clock and geographic information systems. So you have date, time, latitude, and longitude, and a photographic observation. That is verifiable. That's credibility right there. So when scientists say, oh, well, I can't use that data, it depends how the data was collected. If the data has been collected into a database using iNaturalist, they use it all the time. They use it every single day and they know they do. But you know, if you have like a second grade teacher who's kind of keeping data points on a yellow pad, God bless that person, that can't be used by science. So the credibility is actually using these databases that aggregate um, date, time, latitude, longitude, and photographic observations. Do you think it's helpful to have a degree in biology or not really? Well, you know what? Um, thank you, Christina. I wish everybody had a degree in biology because people don't understand the first thing about ecology or how life works. I mean, and actually people with biology degrees don't either because you can go through and get a degree in biology and not understand the first thing about earth system functioning. Uh, I, what I wish is that everybody had to take the um, AP class, the AP environmental sciences class, like in eighth grade. It's not rocket science people. It's fascinating and it's very basic. And everybody should have that basic understanding about how the biosphere works. 
Um, I'm in Woodland in the Sacramento Valley. Do you know any projects that are running in this area? At the moment, I can't come up with any in my brain pan. You can Google uh, Sacramento Valley or Woodland citizen science. Woodland, you know, you're in a hotbed of fantastic nature nuts and there's tons of stuff going on. Actually look at, um, I can't remember the name of it, there's a fantastic roadkill project uh, that UC Davis runs, Fraser Schilling. Um, and that's a very, very important project because roadkill is an enormous destroyer of biology. And it's a place that we can all very much impact kind of quickly and easily if we only bring our attention to it. So uh, look for that. Then you've got rivers in the Sacramento Valley. There's organizations that are doing all sorts of things to try to keep those rivers healthy. And, um, and then there's also agriculture. There's agricultural organizations trying to, to bring um, more environmental equity to the way that we do agriculture, which would be very useful. How do you encourage people to participate in citizen science, especially when people don't think their little bits of data matter? Well, I'll tell you a story, which is told in my book on citizen science by Sam Drogi. And Sam Drogi is um, a US Geological Survey scientist who works in Patuxent, Maryland which is the head kind of of their wildlife, their wildlife work. And they just do amazing work. And he's the most amazing guy. He's really fantastic. And he's invented so many different citizen science platforms. And he's done so much for birds and bees and butterflies. This fabulous guy. So I heard Sam give a talk a number of years ago in which he said to the audience, um, if Thomas Edison had never existed, this light here would still be on because it was in the it was in the air at the time all the information that it was taking to bring electricity into being you know he wasn't the only person working on it and if he had gotten suddenly hit by a car not a car or whatever by a horse somebody else would have invented it and like basic scientific um discoveries are never really the result of just one person. If you read, there's a wonderful two volume, huge volume book, get it out of the library, by uh, Janet Brown about Charles Darwin. And what is so fascinating is all the conversations he had over 50 years, all of the collaborative uh, idea sharing with people from all kinds of different backgrounds to really figure out this theory of evolution by way of natural selection. So Sam Drogi, my USGS survey scientist said, okay, if Thomas Edison wasn't around, we'd still have electricity. But if you did not take that observation of a native bee that you saw on a flower earlier today, that observation would never ever be able to come into being ever again because it was a moment in time and place that has passed. And when you make that observation of time and place and, an, and a species presence, you are making a contribution that can never be replicated. So every little bit of, and he's right. So he said, you know, you're much more, even if you're always anonymous, and you only give your observations to databases, it's, it's um, profoundly and deeply significant and more significant than the person that gets credit for some big idea. So I think that's um, to the heart of something here, which is, you know, we're kind of trained to try to be special. We're trying to train to be set apart from other people. Um, and this is absurd when you think about it because you know, if we end up tanking the human enterprise, it's not going to matter that Shakespeare ever existed. Your observation is deeply important, can never be replicated, can never come again. So that's what I say. I try to say it shorter than that. What are they learning about the Amamutsin near Anyanwebo? Anyan so I, would, I wrote a long article about the Amamutsin in Bay Nature magazine, so you could Google that and read it. 
few years ago. And if any of you don't know about Bay Nature Magazine, it is such a wonderful publication. It only comes out a couple times a year and it's just full of the richness of our incredible area that we live in. So subscribe and help sub support them. They're a nonprofit, but you can read about the Amamutsen. Um, you can you know, pull up my story on the web. And if you can't, it's Ama, A-M-A-H Mutsen, but you can also find it just through my name. Can you talk about the importance of connecting children to nature as we face the challenges of climate change and mass extinction? Now, this is a huge topic. Um, I think we all understand very viscerally and deeply, especially if we're parents of young children. My children are in their 20s now. Uh, they need to be outside. You, you know that they're not really very well adjusted if they don't go outside. You know, they're cranky and they're irritating and you can't stand them until you get them outside. And then they run around and they're happy. Uh, and it changes how they are. So they're, it's very basic. Um, it's a human right and it's a human necessity. I'm a physical therapist and I see the same type of colonialism affecting my patients and the environment of their bodies. I'm so grateful to hear of your paradigm shift. I love this. I'm inspired. I'm said today I have to get out of California and now I'm saying I need to get California back. I love that. So awesome. I love that. Thank you so much. Yes, we need to get California back. We have so much here. We have an amazing place. Um, another way to connect in with California is through the California Native Plant Society. And they have citizen science programs too. And it's a way to start really, they have walks that you can go on with California Native Plant Society people. I went on a walk like a month ago, a socially distanced walk with masks on a part of San Bruno Mountain that is sand dunes. And so there's plants growing there that are thousands, that are millions of years old. Like their, their, their lineage is, is millions of years old. And the sand itself used to be on the coast. So, I mean, you just understand where we are in this deeper way through really investigating it, um, which I, I find incredibly um, rewarding and grounding. How can we support teachers in schools with implementing the environmental principles and concepts? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm in favor of that. I get, I'm going to just confess, I get overwhelmed by, by all of the, bureaucracy of, of the, the school, um, you know, principles and, and things. Yes, uh, citizen science, something that is actually really fantastic um, for school teachers to be, uh, to utilize and kind of, you know, really kind of tailor made for, for that. So, and to the degree that those, that students and classrooms can be connected with these bigger projects, or what, like with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, do your project there. Um, that's just a benefit for everybody. Shout out to bugguide.net as another resource. Yay. Used it today to refine an iNaturalist observation. I posted for a spotted pine sawyer today. Well, I'm going to give you my hats off to your level of inquiry there. And um, yes, bug guide. There's, a, there's a, just a wealth. So here's one thing about iNaturalist that's really fun, is there is a, an artificial intelligence function on that website. So when you make an observation with your phone, you take a picture with the app, and it says, do you want to help making the species identification? And you say yes. The artificial intelligence gives you um, an estimate of what they think that species is. Sometimes it's wrong, but most of the time it's right. And, and it's like a master class right in your palm. It's, it's like the best use of, of technology, I think. So Marav says there's some interesting roadkill projects on iNaturalist, including our Lexington Reservoir Newt Survey. Oh, those newts, they need help. Thank you, Marav. Yes, we need to, um, we need to protect them that when they, they um, are going to do their mating in the fall, they wait for you know, it to be rainy and at night and then they they dash across the road quite frequently where they get killed. If you know exactly where they're going to go, because of my naturalist, you can protect them and help them get across the street so they don't get smushed. I mean, it's really, 
it's very basic, you know, and, and just, you know, to, to acknowledge this moment of time that we're in, we're very enclosed in our own pods and our own spaces. And, you know, we can feel lucky or not lucky depending on our situation, but we could all feel kind of depressed. But when you go out and you make an observation of a wildlife and you see that this duck, uh, that this sparrow, that this newt, that this butterfly is living its own life and you are seeing it. Uh, it's a deep confirmation of the ongoingness of a gorgeous life that we're all part of. So, I mean, I just say you want to cheer up, go outside and look. So I think I'm to the end of the questions there. If anybody else has any more, kind of race through it a little bit, or if anybody wants clarification. Okay. Desiree pointed out, Seek is another downloadable app to iNaturalist that is tailored to younger citizen scientists. So maybe tying into that question about uh, supporting teachers uh, enabling them to support their students. So thank you, Desiree, about SEEK. So SEEK was developed by the iNaturalist people to, um, to be able to be used by kids without geolocating them. So if you use iNaturalist, then, you know, the evil people that are surfing the interwebs can know where you are, right? Because I met Mary Ellen makes an observation of um, a Caspian um, turn at Chrissy Field, they know that I'm at Chrissy Field. And so predators could potentially uh, target where children are if they could find them on that. So SEEK was invented to, to not have that geolocation ability. The thing about SEEK that is, so SEEK is fabulous. You just put your phone with SEEK on it over a species of plant and it automatically tells you what it is. You don't even, it doesn't even ask you the artificial intelligence works faster on SEEK. The downside of SEEK for citizen science is that the data does not get vetted. It does not get um, integrated into big databases. You can take your SEEK observations and then put them in iNaturalist, but that's a whole other step, right? So I think it's a fantastic thing for kids, but if you're older, um, use iNaturalist. John Muir Laws, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous John Muir Laws. What a gift he is to all of us. He's so generous. He has a new book about journaling. He gives everything away for free all the time. Uh, and he's just lovely. Yeah, he made his book available for free download. I mean, I don't know what drives that guy. He's, he's amazing. All right. Well, um, if there aren't any more questions, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming um, and joining us and Mary Ellen, especially for uh, her fabulous talk and for being so generous and asking, answering all of those questions and sharing of her experiences and things like that. Also a huge thanks to the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory for connecting us and for putting this whole thing together. We really appreciate it. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity for folks from the library and folks from the community uh, to get out there and get going. In the follow-up email I'm gonna send out, I've been noting down, of course, because I'm a librarian, all of the books that Mary Ellen has mentioned. So I'm going to link to as many of those in our databases as I can, uh, so that if you're interested in any of the books that she mentioned, I'll provide links to them in our catalog if they're available um, so that you can check them out. Elizabeth, um, just in case I forget to email you this, also add into that book, list of books a book called Street Science. <coughs> it's kind of an older book, but it's really about environmental justice, and it's very good. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for everybody to coming. Let's see, just the chat. Great. Well, thanks everybody for coming and for being interested. Thank you so much for joining us.